Hello, everyone. Welcome again to Afghanistan by Afghans. Uh, today, I have to uh, I have an amazing Afghan on the show that we will be learning about and introducing you to uh, Tahmina Aziz from uh, Toronto, but now living in Vancouver, a journalist, multimedia journalist, and much more than that as well. Um, uh, so we'll get to learn about her a little bit and perhaps learn a little bit about what is it uh, being raised in uh, Canada as an Afghan. So um, welcome, Tamina John, to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on the show. So tell us a little bit, uh, as I mentioned to you off camera, you're my second guest from Canada. Um, <laughs> first one was Rahila John, who is an author. She wrote a book, uh, and now we're talking to an Afghan journalist. So um we're on, we're on onto something good here. Um, so tell me a little bit about growing up in uh, Toronto as an Afghan. Um, I think it was a really great experience just because it's such a multicultural city. Um, I got to grow up with, you know, kids from all walks of life, from countries all over the world. Um, some of my best friends are from uh, South Asia. Um, yeah, you basically meet people from every continent in the country. So it really feels like a little taste of the globe. Um, it, it was really nice to be around other folks. It was we all had a very similar narrative. I found, you know, um, more or less having immigrant parents coming here for a better life for us. And then um, our generation just trying to achieve and doing our best to make our family proud. So um, I love it. I'm a bit homesick, actually. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to visiting Toronto in the near future, Bahir. But um, I love it. I think Toronto is one of the greatest cities in the world, for sure. Oh, wow. Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe I'm a bit biased there. But um, <laughs> uh, I do love the West Coast. It is wonderful. It has its own charms. But I think maybe it's just a, it holds a special place in my heart because that's where I grew up. Of course, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. So growing up, uh, your parents, were they speaking Persian or Pashto, the two languages or many other languages, but the two dominant ones at home? Uh, did you kind of grow up hearing the language? and? Uh, yeah, and for sure. Um, so yes, they basically spoke Farsi a lot at home. And it was just this kind of strange dynamic of like my siblings and I constantly speaking English because that's what we speak in school. Um, and then our parents at home would speak Farsi. And like my older siblings, they're fluent. And then it kind of just like as the, <laughs> the siblings just got younger, um, the ability to speak Farsi became less and less. So I am the least fluent amongst all my siblings, unfortunately. <laughs> and it's a bit embarrassing, but it's something I'm trying to work on. Um, but yes, it was, it's strange. It's like they can understand English perfectly. And so I converse with them in English and then they respond in Farsi and I can understand them perfectly fine. So conversationally, it's great that I can understand it. But then when it comes down to practicing, I feel like I have a bit of an accent. It's unfortunate, <laughs> but that's not the case for other Afghans that I've noticed. Some of them, um, their parents kind of just like <clears throat> hammer down that idea of like, you can't forget how to speak your mother tongue. So um, it's something I'm working on. But right. yeah, it's it's strange. We kind of grew up speaking both English and Farsi. Right, right. And I'm yeah. sure you were exposed like Toronto, the great city that you love so much. You were exposed to all these other cultures as well, right? And South Asian cultures as well. Exactly. Uh, did you pick up any of the other languages? Did you pick up Hindi or Urdu? Alongside. You would think I would. Um, I watched a lot of Bollywood as a kid. So maybe if I stuck to watching it a bit longer than I could have acquired the knowledge. I know other friends of mine who know how to speak Hindi, just basing it off of the movies that they've seen. So I'm like, some people are just linguistically talented. And I wish I had that skill. <laughs> I'm kind of mostly monolingual. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that I'm bilingual. But Mm -hmm. It's kind of like I speak predominantly English. Um, of yeah, we, we also learned how to speak French in school as well. So it was just another language that they wanted us to learn. Um, but yeah, I learned a little bit of like Spanish, um, just like little different words here and there that you pick up. I know right, a couple right. words in Russian, just 
Yeah, but they're very yeah. rare, like scarce. <laughs> it's like random stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, you deal with communication, right? Uh, after yeah. all, as a journalist, you're uh, you're it's uh, part of the job, a, exactly. You're a wordsmith, you know. You, you have to, <laughs> I try. <laughs> whatever, whatever the language, you are the wordsmith in it. Um, yeah. <laughs> what, what kind of inspired you uh, to go into journalism? And, Great question. Um, and I get asked this quite often, actually. Um, I've always, growing up, I watched a lot of TV. I watched a lot of news. Um, I think my family and I, especially my dad, he's a big news junkie. So it's just like having surrounding yourself with your parents who are constantly watching it, you're going to watch it. And I just thought that was such a cool job to be a news reporter and a news anchor uh, to tell the news. And then I also love uh, storytelling and meeting people. And it just kind of encompassed everything that I enjoy doing into one job. So as a multimedia journalist, I'm here pitching stories. I'm going out and shooting everything and then interviewing the people out in public, coming back and writing everything and creating that. We don't create the stories, but we tell the stories um, right. in a creative matter anyway. And yeah, it's just, it's a very exciting job. I can't really, I'm not the type to kind of just like do the same repetitive thing every day. Right. I like right. knowing that there's a new story. I can't predict my day tomorrow. Right. Like I have no idea what I'm doing tomorrow. And that's just the norm. Of, of being a journalist. You mentioned exactly. your dad being a news junkie. What, uh, what sort of cultural elements that they bring with them from Afghanistan? Was it their love for music, their love for books or news? What did they bring uh, with them? Yeah. I think, well, definitely, yeah. Is news part of the Afghan culture? I guess it is. Journalism is big in Afghanistan, right? Um, food was really big, music and dancing. I think when it comes to just like, obviously the hospitality is a big one too. So um, I know it's always kind of hard to pass down every piece of culture that you were raised with from another country and bringing it here. Um, but in terms of what my parents were able to preserve, um, was just like the kindness of, uh, of Afghans, you know, being generous to your neighbors, no matter where they're from, you're here to like drop off like a Tupperware full of food that they've made to welcome you into the neighborhood, stuff like that. Just like mm -hmm. being very social, uh, which I truly enjoy. Um, the parties, there were endless parties growing up, which I miss kind of now, especially with COVID and everything. Um, but going to all these weddings were, uh, what's a big deal back then as a kid, I was, I didn't quite enjoy them as much. The music was really loud, but now it's like, you, you miss what you can't have anymore. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. And seeing all that. That's beautiful. No, that's beautiful. Yeah. And, and in this show, that's what we're trying to kind of uncover is all these qualities and layers that makes someone who's Afghan or, or, or come from that heritage. Mm -hmm. You mentioned kindness. I wonder if there are other qualities you have picked up on uh, throughout your life that you think, oh, you know, this is very Afghan or something that gets really enhanced. Oh, totally. I have one that's like right now, just like. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't even let me finish the question. You're like, I got one. I know. Oh, I'm like, I have one right now. And I Say think it's it going to be a, a Middle Eastern, South Asian thing, but um paying the bill. I, <laughs> I'll go out with friends and stuff. Um, maybe like a one-on-one -on -one, like girlfriend date. And I'm like, Oh, I got this, but it's kind of like my, it, it's like the generosity that we have that we'll pay. But then I kind of like expect a bit of a fight, you know, like, okay, they're going to play around and toy with the bill a little. And they're like, Oh, you'll pay. That's great. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? Um, yeah, that's fine. I'll take it and I'll pay. And then I'll notice they'll never reciprocate. I'm like, this is interesting. Right. Whereas, you know, if you talk to other Afghans, it's like there's this really funny TikTok video that kind of encompasses that whole situation. It's like, I knew you're going to do that. So I paid the bill when I was heading to the washroom. And so that's a big cultural shock thing that I found was like, yeah, people will like angrily fight <laughs> amongst themselves to pay the bill. Right. And that is not the case in like Western culture. I don't know why that's the first thing that comes to mind, but generosity. It's it's like generosity at its best, probably. Hospitality, at a, at a, that whole 
whole thing exactly uh, <laughs> but in a very very weird and uh competitive way like no i am more <laughs> generous than you exactly and i will show you how generous <laughs> i am <laughs> i paid the bill on the phone on the way to the restaurant you know is that, <laughs> <laughs> is that <the> <laughs> imagine <laughs> i wouldn't I, be I, surprised I, yeah yeah no no that's great no so i mean you mentioned kindness you mentioned generosity are there other qualities when you think of your parents you know here they are people who have come from afghanistan and they kind of came into this culture and 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 what what do you think what do you think they brought with them uh, you know qualitatively quality wise other stories pains pleasures you know what did they bring with them you know um in terms of like in a positive light i'm sure that's yeah what you sure want to shine positive or yeah i mean positive or not so positive <laughs> but yeah maybe even negative too okay let's do a <laughs> i'm sure there's other folks out there who are gonna discuss maybe the negatives but of course there's like the trauma of yeah, trying to run away from a war-torn country and that intergenerational trauma that gets passed down so that's a big one um yeah. I think another one that is actually all kind of twisted into a positive light now is, um, I guess, maybe this incessant need to be successful. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so they just always wanted the best for us. Maybe that's a whole immigrant thing, too. But within Afghans, yeah. too, it's just like they sacrificed literally their life for us to get here. Um, and all they want is for us to live a happy life, you know? So just kind of instilling that nature of being hardworking. I think that's a really big mm -hmm. Afghan trait is, is right. that hustle mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. get go. Like the moment you're a kid, we want you to be financially independent and go out there and conquer the world. So mm -hmm. I definitely am grateful for that, which is why I right. think I'm able to last in this industry. That's a really fast paced, competitive industry. Um, it's right. because that's the kind of upbringing that I was surrounded by. Right. right. Yeah. And, and I mean, speaking of the industry, also going into the field of journalism isn't mm -hmm. necessarily one of the top priorities of a lot of, you know, Afghans no. or immigrant families. How did you how did you get to do it? What was oh, what was their reaction? <laughs> of course, you would pin that out because that is very true. It's really hard because uh, you kind of amongst many Afghans, I guess, is the top three career choices, if I were to ask you, you'd probably point out doctor, lawyer, engineer, right? And that's the only right. three that our parents are really aware of. And that's what they define as like conventionally successful. But it's not that they didn't want me to pursue a career in journalism. It was just a very unpredictable career. Um, it's constantly downsizing, as I had mentioned before recording this interview. Um, my job used to be um, something that four people would do in a day. You know, there's an editor who edits the video, but I'm doing that. There's a shooter that goes and goes out and records everything. I do that. And then I'm the writer and then I'm also the reporter. So um, and the producer, there's there's all these different bodies. And so uh, it's an unpredictable industry. They're not used to that. It's unconventional. It's not this regular nine to five. Um, the way that I was basically able to convince them was kind of just being bold about it, which is what you kind of need to do in this sense. Um, I sat down with them and I said, hey, like I toyed around with the idea of being a doctor and a lawyer, and I really don't see myself working in either of those occupations. It's just not it doesn't fit my personality. Give me two years. If I don't find a job in this industry in two years, I will do a career switch. I'll go back to school and do something else. That was the deal. So I just got really fortunate to hustle hard enough and get a job within six months after making that promise. Yeah, wow. <laughs> that's my story. That's very impressive. That, that's <laughs> and they're happy about that. They're, happy they're very happy that. now. They yeah. must be <laughs> Yeah, they, they must be also kind of uh, culturally appreciative of culture and such too for to support you on that path as well. Are, are they, is that the case? Oh, for sure. Like you don't really get to meet a lot of Afghan journalists in Canada, um, let alone like on camera reporters. I think there right. might be less than a handful across 35 million people in Canada. There's just mm -hmm. maybe like, I probably could count on one hand 
how many Afghan Canadian, like the hyphenated identity that we have, an Afghan Canadian journalist. Um, mm -hmm. That might change given the onset of other Afghan immigrants that we might have just recently accepted who are all, all journalists themselves. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's not a very common job, definitely. Right, 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 <laughs> so right. they are very appreciative of the fact that um, I'm kind of, they call it like I'm a trailblazer is what they say. Right. And I'm like, I was going to say the black sheep, but you know. <laughs> a black sheep is one way to put, put it out. Yeah. But it's um, my family and I are just very creative. And maybe this is another Afghan trait of ours is we're just naturally people who are storytellers. We love uh, mm -hmm. whether it's singing, dancing, creating art in any form. And, and in this generation, we do a lot of video storytelling. My sister, she herself is a filmmaker. So she was a bit more of a black sheep. I think she kind of like. Um, <laughs> she went too far. She went too far. <laughs> no, we can't do that's too. That's too competitive. Um, no, she's doing great. And then I kind of was like, "Hey, I'll, I'll maybe I'll take a step back and pursue something not as um, as competitive. Maybe it's just, it is still very competitive, but yeah, a bit more stable in that sense." That's correct. No, that's correct. And, and you mentioned, you mentioned uh, storytelling and, and being lovers of storytelling. Yeah, there is so much stories in Afghan culture. There's stories being told um, about every aspect. I mean, I remember growing up and just hearing stories from grandma about this and about that, like life is passed on through stories uh, exactly. and tales. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of times oral tales, because it was, there wasn't much time to kind of write and read and so there's a lot of oral storytelling um so when it comes to storytelling what sort of stories uh are you interested to tell for me it's uh the stories that i that i get to listen to when i meet people in an everyday setting so it depends on what i get assigned um this may not be related to i guess specifically afghans because with afghan storytelling um, there's like this poetry with it, which I try to incorporate into my storytelling with news, but it can be kind of difficult because I feel like romance is big in Afghanistan and it's storytelling. You can't really incorporate romance so much in news, but um, if you can, by all means, we can definitely play around with the words and everything. Um, but yeah, my type of storytelling, I guess, is just telling the factual news, but also keeping it entertaining for folks to sustain that two minutes to watch that story and shooting it in very creative ways. Less, right. less of me speaking and letting others speak. I think that's really important. That's beautiful. That's beautifully put. Yeah, and, and I meant yeah, that you went to your work directly after I asked you what type of stories you like to tell. You're in the work mode right now. I really You could have done this two hours after you got off work, not the same five I'm minutes like, after. I just you know? filed web, yeah. <laughs> but, but kind of like, yeah, what type of stories do you feel yourself more drawn to? Not necessarily for work, but okay. uh, other types of stories that you may have heard as a child growing up or, or, or other stories that have inspired you. Um, what do you find yourself wanting to tell or to explore or read? I think I'm a big advocate and, and fan of any story that kind of roots for the underdog, you know? Okay. Yeah. Just hearing about whether it could be a true story or one that's not, um, those narratives that, that, that storyline that you generally watch or listen to of someone who you didn't expect to win that gold medal to shoot that basketball like final shot um maybe because i kind of relate to that in a sense i think maybe many afghans might we're all underdogs just trying to like prove to the world that we are capable and we are these ambitious intelligent human beings that should and should always be taken seriously um seeing people like hustle like that that strength that hard work i think i find those stories just so inspirational and on days when i'm maybe not feeling my most confident i just think of a person say like oprah who has gone through so much and it's like okay she can do it 
we all can do it. Like you just have to kind of pull inspiration from all these success, successful figures. Um, and those kinds of narratives are, are ones that I'm, that I truly like. Yeah. Yeah. That's Would beautiful. You agree? Do you have that too? Uh, yeah, I guess in terms of, uh, as you were mentioning about like having to prove yourself, mm -hmm. um, uh, and usually with communities that are, uh, you know, underprivileged or have been told over and over that, that underserving, mm -hmm. you're kind of told over and over, you can't do this. You're not good enough. Yeah. All of that stuff. You definitely develop a, a certain amount of, you know, a rebel uh, with the cause, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes a lot of sense that you would be drawn to that sort of a thing and be like, because I think as human beings, we are, we know ourselves. So mm -hmm. we are like, Oh no, I'm a very noble and creative and, and strong being. Why am I being told otherwise? Exactly. Right? You don't uh, let others and, define you, you know, who you are and you just need to, you know, work, hustle and make sure that they'll figure it out sooner or later. They'll know. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and you're a great example of that. Of just following your heart and 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 doing That's your, your, and Thank your you. journalism. Um, what sort of uh, stuff nowadays? And kind of shifting to Afghanistan's issue. Uh, did you were you were you in the news when the Afghanistan situation happened in August? Mm -hmm. uh, did you get to cover it? What was your involvement? Um, it was so difficult. I'm sure that many Afghans around the world we were just mourning, and I think. Yeah, I was actually covering it quite extensively here locally um, on Vancouver Island. Uh, it was so tricky, though, because <clears throat> it was basically the lead up until the fall of uh, the, the fall of Kabul. And I remember just like I, I like my heart was starting to shatter and I could just like hear it break. You know, uh, I wasn't performing my best in, in the other stories that I was being assigned or pitching. Like I really wanted to cover what was happening in Afghanistan. And then finally um, my team and I agreed that it is something that we wanted to cover. But the thing when it comes to being a local storyteller or local news reporter is that you always kind of need to have that local connection. So mm -hmm. I can't necessarily tell an international story without trying to find an Afghan who lives here. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how familiar you, familiar you are with Vancouver Island, but there are very few Afghans. So it was a hustle. I think the biggest thing about um, my job is also chasing the right voices. Mm -hmm. So I spent all day up until like my deadline of 2.30, even that's past my deadline when it comes to interviewing someone. Um, I finally managed to find two Afghans, two local Afghans to speak with me about the issue. And I'm like, oh, my God, thank goodness, because if I didn't get those voices, this, the piece wouldn't be as powerful mm -hmm. and I'm, they may have scrapped it. But finally, when I managed to find um, these two uh, young women to speak to, um, that led to more coverage following up with that. And so we spoke about um, their thoughts about the lead up to it. And then when the Taliban finally did take over, um, just trying to capture the emotions that mm -hmm. um, Afghans and um, like Afghan diaspora feeling. Um, mm -hmm. It was a very strange time though. I know I was dealing with my own em emotional turmoil, like behind the scenes, like I'd be crying in the morning and night and then mm -hmm. getting to work, I'm like wiping away my tears and I'm like, okay, I have a story to tell, but it was kind of cathartic because it was the only story that I wanted to talk about was what was going on um, mm -hmm. up until like even 9-11 and everything. So yes, mm -hmm. I was able to cover it extensively. And I was also um, part of this um, Afghan Canadian group amongst other young Afghans and kind of giving them um, media prep like oh, training them, media cool. training, if you will, because there was a lot of um, news outlets across Canada trying to reach out to Afghan Canadians to speak to them about what their thoughts are on what's happening, to get some like expert advice, but also right. just personal takes. So as you might know, not a lot of Afghans have media training at all or any exposure. So it's just nice to kind of like hear from an Afghan reporter, like this is the stuff that I like to hear when I do my interviews, take that what you will in terms of <laughs> an interviewee, but right, right. No, that's how great. you make a successful interview. So 
Yeah, I'll try my very best to kind of give back to the community in any way. Oh, yeah. That's beautiful. That's pretty. What else? What are some other uh, activities, either of the past or current or future, that you would want to be involved in with your uh, with the Afghan community? Aspect yeah. Um, well, right now there's a, a couple groups here in the West Coast. Um, the ones that I'm there's one that I'm currently involved in, which is based in mostly in Toronto, but they encompass Afghan Canadians across Canada. Uh, they're basically fighting for um, the acceleration of paperwork so that there's more Afghans who could be, uh, or like expedition. Yeah, let's just say when the paperwork could be um, expedited. accelerated, expedited, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, trying to basically bring in more Afghans at a shorter period of time, because right now mm -hmm. there's just a lot of vagueness in terms of how many Afghans we might be seeing coming to Canada. Mm -hmm. The Canadian government hasn't necessarily defined how long we'd have to wait to see that happening. They've committed 50K, but our group is fighting for 95K at least. And mm -hmm. we want that to happen within this year because every day is just a big struggle and you never know the, you, you can't predict anyone's safety mm -hmm. in the country right now. So that's a big one. But then there's also um, other local organizations that are trying to fundraise and look for donations um, to help resettle or ease the resettlement of Afghan refugees here, which is mm -hmm. great. And helping them establish themselves, meeting other professionals um, within the area and teaching them skills that are necessary to succeed in this new environment that they're in. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, these 40, uh, you said from 50 to 95, correct? Mm -hmm. are, are these individuals who have worked with the government of Canada or just everybody on human? In terms of the number that we're hoping to get? Yeah. Uh, so they're just like everyday Afghans um, that we're hoping to basically bring to Canada from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, because right now we've noticed that it's just private sponsorships, right? And obviously those who um, have worked with, um, who are like Afghan mm -hmm. allies essentially. So we're fighting for those who are from the most vulnerable communities first because their lives are most at risk. And um, right. basically broadening that definition of who's worthy of coming here. We think every life is worthy, right? So um, the more people we can bring, the better essentially. That's right. Well, very appreciative of all the work you do. I'm sure uh, everyone is also. It's thankful. definitely a group and effort. I can't take group, yeah, any yeah, credit for that. Take it, I try take my it, best. To help take the credit and pass it on. <laughs> totally. Yes. <laughs> uh, but but I thank you very much for coming on the show and giving us your time uh, right after work. So thank you very much so much. Of course. For that. This was a yeah. pleasure. Thank you so much. It was yeah. really fun chatting with you. It was as well. So uh, thank you, Tamina John. And uh, if you guys have liked uh, this show, there's more conversations with other Afghans. So please uh, check out the description for the link for more such conversations with Afghans on this show, Afghanistan by Afghans. Thank you.